Hello and welcome. You join me in Harrogate, North Yorkshire. In the 1500s, naturally occurring waters were discovered springing to the ground here in the spa town. And ever since then, thousands of people have flocked in every year to take the cure, as it was becoming known, in the hope of curing all manner of medical ailments and illnesses. By the turn of the Victorian period, Harrogate had become the moniker of its day, a space for the rich and famous to come and play. Great hydrotherapy centres were established to cater for these visitors, offering everything from electro-hydrotherapy, mud baths, peat baths, sulphur baths, essentially whatever these incredibly wealthy visitors would pay for, the doctors would provide for them. Harrogate is unique in the fact that there are no factories here. There's no industry of any kind other than the spa trade. That was to preserve the tranquility of the spa town. Even when the railways first arrived, they dug huge underground tunnels to bring the trains in to try and reduce that pollution. In 1801, there were about 800 people living here. By 1901, though, that had shot up to nearly 20,000. And that was a direct result of these hydrotherapy centers. And as fascinating, as the royalty and the gentry that were visiting Harrogate are, it's not them that I want to talk about today. It's the local people. It's the people that were working in the hydrotherapy centers, the ones that were providing and catering for the visitors flocking in here and the hotels building their homes. And of course, perhaps the most important time for the local people of Harrogate came between 1914 and 1918. And it's then that I would like to talk about today. I'd like to talk about the resilience of a community that had to adapt to a world that it didn't recognize. I'd like to talk to you about heroes. I'd like to talk to you about leaders. And I'd like to talk to you about some of the most inspirational people I have ever had the pleasure of researching. So without further ado, I'd be delighted if you can join me for their stories today. Please. On the 5th of August 1914, the people of Harrogate awoke to find that their world had changed. After decades of peace in Europe, kings, czars and kaisers had squabbled Europe onto the precipice was about to come perhaps its most dark time. For many of them, the first indication may have been the declarations of war that had been hammered to the doors of the churches, the library and the Kuisar. Within four years, along with the royal family changing its name from the Germanic saxe Coburg Gotha to Windsor, and the founder of Betty's, Fritz Butzer, changing his name to the much more French-sounding Frederick Belmont, the Kursaal, a German word for an entertainment space found within spa towns or cure hall, had become the Royal Hall. The sign also indicated that valued Germanic visitors who as of midnight had become enemy aliens should report to the local police station. Her Otto Schwarz and his band who had delighted residents and visitors alike for decades, performing in the Valley Gardens and the Royal Hall, often playing for free to raise money for charitable causes, were sent to an internment camp on the Isle of Man. The great European nations were no strangers to empire-building dust-ups. But unlike conflicts of the past, where only a few ten or hundred thousand troops would be required, just like the European nations themselves, wars have become industrialized, they've become mechanized, and thus millions of troops would be required to go off and fight. Unlike France and Germany, that immediately imposed forced military subscription, Britain wanted its young men to sign up under their own volition and do their bit for king and country. But how do you convince these young men to leave their homes, their families, their friends, especially when you're leaving somewhere as beautiful as a spa town like Harrogate? Well, that's where one of Lord Kitchener, the Minister of War's generals, came up with the idea for the PALS battalions, essentially putting all the same men from one town into a regiment of their own. 
The idea was me, you, Tom, Dick and Harry, we'll all sign up, we'll go off to the front, we'll beat the Bosch and we'll be home for time and tea and medals and stories to woo the ladies of the girls' college with. Just three days after the declarations of war had been nailed to the doors of the Corsal, on Saturday the 8th of August, the Harrogate Herald announced that that evening there'd be a meeting here in the Winter Gardens. It was hosted by the Lord Mayor and over 2,000 men from Harrogate turned up to hear how they could do their bit for king and country. The Harrogate Rifle Club were also here as well. They were offering free lessons and training to these men before they went off to the army and gave them shooting practice outside of the grounds of the Corsal. The local gun shops even offered discounted prices on their ammunition to be used for practice. Within a few days, hundreds of men were marching down Station Parade on their way to training. By the end of 1914, 2,000 men from Harrogate had signed up for the PALS battalions, two of which were formed from Harrogate men alone. But it wasn't just that. There were more changes being made to the town in other ways. Uh, we had volunteer services set up around the town. We had hostels starting to be erected. Soon, the buses that were used to transport Harrogatonians to work from Bilton and Starbeck were being given to the military. That meant we needed new buses here, and as petrol was at a premium, they decided to introduce the famous gas-powered buses. Out of the thousands of Harrogatonians that took part in the events of 1914 to 1918, I could share any one of their fascinating stories. But there is one that's particularly close to my heart, and that's the story of Donald Simpson Bell. Donald Bell was born in Queens Road of Harrogate. He had attended St. Peter's School and later Harrogate Grammar before going down to Westminster College in London to study to become a teacher. Not only did he excel himself in his education, but in his sporting life as well. He had played rugby, cricket, tennis, but football was his real passion. After he qualified from Westminster, he played professional football for Crystal Palace, for Newcastle and Mansfield Town. Upon returning to Harrogate, he took a job teaching at Starbeck College and to supplement his income as a primary school teacher, he started playing first division football. This is long before the days of multi-million pound salaries and all the nonsense that we see in the sport today. He did this at Bradford Park Avenue, my dad's old team, and soon became one of their stars. Just nine months after joining them, he had secured promotion to Division One, what is today the Premier League. Just a few years into his footballing and schooling career though, Donald Bell asked both the football club and Starbeck College if he could leave, as he wanted to sign up for the First World War, and in doing so became the first professional footballer to join the British Army. He didn't join the Harrogate Pals Regiment, but the Green Howards, Yorkshire's very own regiment. It is perhaps the most prestigious regiment within the British Army. Donald Bell was not only popular with his officers, but with the men as well. They were put through rigorous testing, many of them very fresh the regiment. And as Donald Bell was incredibly fit, he acted as a mentor to them. He was also a celebrity within the regiment and was incredibly well liked by his men. Eventually he bumped into a friend of his from Harrogate Grammar, Archie White, who was already an officer within the Green Howards. He was surprised that a gentleman of Donald Bell's calibre hadn't been promoted as well, so after putting in a good word, Donald Bell became second lieutenant Donald Bell. The Green Howard served all along the front, at Passchendaele and of course at the Somme. And on the 5th of July, they were charged with taking the Horseshoe Trench. The Horseshoe Trench was only a few tens of metres away from the British lines, an incredibly valuable position. You could literally reach across and touch the Germans there. Donald Bell and his company led the charge. They had what were known as hand bombs, essentially grenades. They loaded up their satchels and Bell, now being an officer, just had his sidearm with him. They charged towards the German lines and using his rugby skills, Bell himself made his way through the mud and into the German lines. After just a few moments of respite, they heard a crack coming over their left shoulder as a machine gun opened up, taking out tens of the company. Donald Bell and a few other men managed to hit the ground before bullets started flying their way and found themselves crawling through a small supply trench towards the machine gun position. As they got closer, Bell saw an opportunity. He turned round and discussed a plan with the two men that were following him. They shook hands and agreed to assault it. 
Bell had to cover 30 yards of open, muddy ground before he got to the machine gun post. As he stood up, the machine gun swiveled round to take him out, and as one of the privates who were with him described it, using his cricketing skills, he bowled out the machine gun perfectly. Then, whipping out his service revolver that only had six shots in the chamber, he managed to clear out the trench of 50 Germans with the two men in support. After a few moments making sure there were no stragglers, they made their way back to the British lines to much celebration and jubilation. Bell described it as the biggest fluke of his life, but the two men with him saw it very differently, and the next day he was nominated for a Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross is the highest military medal for gallantry in the world. Out of the tens of millions of British and Commonwealth servicemen that have served since its creation in the Crimean War, only 1,380 have ever been awarded. Compare that to the American's Medal of Honor, where over 20,000 have gone out. That's not to do as a service to anyone that's received a Medal of Honor, but the VC is something that's almost impossible to get. It can only be received by someone that's shown to be using their own initiative and putting themselves in almost mortal danger. Donald Bell is one of three Harrogatonians to have been awarded the VC and one of the very cool people I'd like to tell you about today. At the time of the First World War, women were barred from voting or serving in military combat roles. Many saw this as an opportunity not only to serve their country, but to gain more rights and independence. With millions of men away from home, women filled in manufacturing and agricultural positions on the home front. Others provided support on the front lines as nurses, doctors, ambulance drivers, translators, and in rare cases, on the battlefield. So effective were they that this led directly to the women's emancipation movement in 1919. As the German army started advancing through Belgium, thousands of refugees made their way across the channel. Harrogate welcomed them with open arms. One of the main reasons why they got here safely, though, was due to a girl called Betty Stevenson. Betty and her family were part of the YMCA, not the, the Young Man's Christian Association. At the outbreak of war, as she had studied in Flanders and spoke Flemish, her, her mother and auntie travelled down to King's Cross Railway Station in London to help these refugees find their way up to Harrogate. Once they arrive, the Yorkshire Hotel acts as a distribution centre, sending them to live in other hotels and private residences around the town. One of the Belgians enjoyed his time at the Yorkshire so much that after the war he became their general manager. But Betty wasn't done helping. When she was just 19 and much against her father's wishes, she decided to go and join the YMCA efforts in France itself. After taking a boat across the channel, she found herself just a few miles back from the front lines outside of Passchendaele. The Harrogate Borough Corporation even created a fund where they found £150 to buy her a fort that would take her around northern France. She also helped these wounded servicemen's families go over and visit them. She was described by the people on the front lines as the happy warrior, and she stayed in France for another two years, almost until the end of the war. Out of all the refugees that did find their way to Harrogate though, there's one person that took in more than anyone else. His name was James Robert Ogden. By the time this photograph of James Street was taken in 1890, thousands of visitors from around not only Europe, but the world were flocking into Harrogate every year to enjoy its delights. As a result, many shrewd Yorkshiremen had taken it upon themselves to open up businesses to cater for these wealthy visitors. By now, we already had Farrah's Toffee Shop, Fatherini's Jewellers, and ex-Royal Warrant holder Wood's Fine Linen, to name but a few. It's whilst all this going on that a boy called James had finished his schooling at St Peter's and engaged an apprenticeship at a local jewellery shop. He soon proved himself not only to be an exquisite jeweller of the highest calibre, but an incredibly fair and likeable businessman. By 1913, he had opened up his new premises here on the fashionable James Street. Just a year later, though, the First World War would break out. Along with moving into a much smaller house so the Belgian refugees could take over his home, Ogden made a larger sacrifice in sending all four of his young sons off to the front, including his youngest, Walter. Walter was just 16 and lied about his age to sign up. That meant that he couldn't join the Harrogate Pals. They all knew that he wasn't old enough. And so he joined a regiment with men who he had never met before. But despite this, just like his father proved himself to be an incredibly capable young man. And a year later was sent back to Britain on a top secret mission. 
The year before this photograph was taken, the British had developed Little Willie, the first ever land ship, what we now know as a tank. Walter Ogden was placed in command of a tank within H Company. Now, British military tradition dictates that tank commanders are allowed to name their own tanks, but it should start with the initials of their company. As Ogden found himself within H Company, we have a picture here of his sister tank, the Hector tank. You also have the Helen tank, the Hattie tank, the Henry tank. But Ogden asked special permission to name his tank after a person, after a place. Up until now, these land ships had been used, uh, Battle of the Somme and so on, but only 10 or 15 at a time. And when they weren't breaking down, they were getting caught in the mud. The military realized they wanted these new weapons to be effective. They had to be used in numbers. So on the 20th of November, 1917, 400 land ships were assembled in the village of Cambrai in northern France, the aim of breaking through the Hindenburg Line, the Germans' last big line of defense, nearly 300 meters thick, full of barbed wire, trenches, and anti-tank weapons. Walter Ogden, in the Harrogate tank, led the charge, and in three hours took more ground the British and French had taken in three months' worth of fighting. The Ogden family have been kind enough to grant me access to their archives. Here we have a letter dated the 27th of November 1917 from Wally. My dearest parents, we have just got back to a little village 10 miles behind the line. After a very hard week's fighting, the village we were in was blown up by a mine, so there's nothing left of it, but we're all jolly glad to get back. It seemed like a dream. I cannot tell you the details, but I'll try and give you a rough outline. We left on the night of the 19th and proceeded to a position in the front of our line, arriving there about midnight. We all up and waited for the attack to commence. At 6.10 the artillery opened up with a terrific barrage of the Hindenburg line. At the same time we crossed the front line and picked our way over no man's land and made it for the Bosch lines. When the Germans saw us crawling with the infantry behind us, they offered very little resistance and came over in hundreds and surrendered. As we got nearer the Germans, the artillery barrage lifted and we entered the wide belts of barbed wire, which were 20 feet wide and 8 feet high. After we had taken the German trenches, we made for the village, which we held until we got close enough to use our guns. But our buses, that's what we call our tanks, got into the village. We moved up the next morning to take the village, which had been lost the night before. We left at 10 in the morning to take the village and the wood. It was here that the tanks had to fight for their lives, as the Bosch were either drunk or drugged of that, I'm sure. They swarmed round the tank in hundreds, and we mowed them down like rabbits. Well, at nightfall, His Majesty's landship Harrogate crew returned to the wood about a mile and a half into the village and stayed in reserve for two days. Then we all moved back and eventually arrived here late last night, having taken part in the greatest battle in history. I lost two of my crew the first day, but the rest of us came through without scratch. Well, I must close now, but I'll write again soon. All love, your ever-loving son, Wally. After the war, he too was awarded with the Croix de Jour, one of France's highest military medals. Whilst Europe was still picking up the peace of the conflict, Harrogate received a resurgence in visitors like never before. To this day, Ogden's has jewellery shops both here in York and even in the fashionable Piccadilly Arcade in London, right next door to the jeweller which to this day still makes the Victoria Cross. Out of all of the hundreds of thousands of guests to walk those through those doors over the last few years, the ones that by far spent the most money were the Russians. By the turn of the 20th century, it wasn't just the British well-to-do travelling into Harrogate for the spa trade, but lords, ladies, princes, princes, counts, countesses of Europe were travelling in here regularly for their summer holidays. Perhaps the most notable of all of these, though, with the Tsar and Tsarina of Russia. Six months before the Tsarina's wedding, she was suffering from a little bit of lower back pain and came to the beautiful spa town of Harrogate to have it seen to. She decided to stay in Cathcart House, just behind me here. Cathcart House was different to all of the big grand hotels that you'll find around Harrogate. It was what we might describe today as a boutique establishment, perfect for the very private and discreet Russian royal family. She not only fell in love with the excellent accommodation, but the Allen family that ran it. And upon finding out that Miss Allen had just given birth to twins, asked if she could adopt them as her surrogate godchildren, and even suggest they name the twins after her and Nicholas, and, well, I guess the future Tsarina suggests that you sort of go along with it. By the twins' first birthday, she was now empress of all of Russia and its dominions, and for their birthday present, sent them two spectacular gifts, 
one of which is a solid gold pair of cufflinks designed by none other than Carl Fabergé. This and a whole collection of letters between the Romanov and the Allen family can be seen down at our Pump Rooms Museum. You'll recognise Fabergé's name from his infamous eggs. These were created for the Tsars to give to their Tsarinas for birthday and anniversary presents. And for their second anniversary, he commissioned perhaps one of the finest in the collection, the rock crystal egg. That is not glass that you see there. It is solid rock crystal, studded with diamonds and jewels and emeralds from all around the world. And inside, 15 miniature hand-painted pictures of all of the couple's favorite places. If you were to twizzle that huge emerald on the top, it would spin them round, revealing Balmoral and Windsor Castle, the Russian Winter Palace, and Cathcart House in Harrogate as well. The Tsar and Tsarina were back in Russia by the time that hostilities started in August 1914, but the Grand Duchess George of Russia, one of the Tsar's cousins, found herself marooned here with two of her daughters. She decided to make the best of a bad situation, and as her husband was back in Russia establishing military hospitals, she decided to do the same here in Harrogate. She established a repertoire with the Tommies, and often became close personal friends with many of them. There's a whole collection of letters that Tommies would send to her and she would send back, finding out how they were doing once they had left her care. There's a fantastic quote that I have here from Malcolm Neeson's Wells and Swells, perhaps one of the most comprehensive histories of Harrogate. It comes straight from the Grand Duchess's diary. A soldier has just woken up after his treatment, having returned from the front lines, and he says to the Grand Duchess, Where am I? She says, You're in Harrogate. Who are you? The soldier says. I am Princess Marthe of Denmark. The soldier paused for a moment and said, Who's that? She replied, that is Princess Victoria, the king's daughter. And who is that, he said. That is the Imperial Highness Grand Duchess George of Russia. The soldier takes an even longer pause before saying, blimey, we are amongst the nuts. Her hostel didn't just look after British soldiers, but soldiers from around the world. In fact, all of the hydrotherapy centers in Harrogate and the Grand Hostels were converted to look after wounded servicemen. Some did still take private patients. Over 10,000 wounded soldiers were treated by the Harrogate Hospital system. The Tsar and Tsarina would never return to Harrogate after the First World War. Despite this being their home away from home, by 1918 the Bolshevik Revolution had taken place. Queen Victoria described Nicholas II as a sweet and caring young boy and those were excellent qualities for her husband but not ideal as a Russian leader. He wasn't respected or trusted either by the people or the nobles and was put under house arrest after having been forced to abdicate. Eventually, with the fear that the white flags, the counter-revolutionaries, the ones that wanted to bring the Tsar and his family back into power might rise up and free the family under the pretext of a family photograph, they were marched down into the basement and executed along with their five young children, including the Princess Anastasia. But of course it wasn't just royalty that suffered during this time, it was everyone. With a heavy heart, I'd like to invite you to join me for our final stop at the Harrogate War Memorial. This photograph was taken in September 1923, five years after the First World War had ended at the unveiling of the War Memorial, where over 25,000 people attended. That was a significant portion of the population of the town at the time. It took five years after the end of the war for it to be completed because there were lots of them around the country to do and not many men left to build them. The photograph that you see here is of the Harrogate Palace. They've just finished their rifle training outside the grounds of the Kwoizal, courtesy of the Harrogate Rifle Club, and are making their way to their first training camp. Thousands of their friends and family have gone down to the station to bid them farewell, with calls of still more men wanted. Out of the 2,000 men from Harrogate that signed up, just over 1,000 would come back. The Harrogate Powers would fight at Passchendaele, at Eeps, 
and of course the Somme along with many other battlefronts. And it wasn't just the men that didn't come back, but it was ones that did and would never be the same again. The idea of Lord Kitchener's armies were, oh, we'll all sign up together, me, you, Tom, Dick and Harry, we'll go off to France, we'll beat the Bosch and be home for time, teen medals. And you can see where they were coming from. They wanted you to go off and fight with your friends, but what they didn't realise, if an entire battalion were to be wiped out, then an entire village or town would lose its young men. We started off today about talking about Donald Bell, the footballer that played for my dad's old team, Bradford Park Avenue. Just four days after the action for which he received his Victoria Cross, as his commander described it through a similar act of gallantry that could have won him a second, whilst charging across no man land towards the Germans, he was struck. He continued fighting until he was struck again, and by the time the men had got to him, he had passed away and would never learn that he had received Britain's highest military medal for gallantry. Instead, his wife Rhonda, to whom he had taken special leave just a few weeks before to marry and had only spent 10 days with, would go down to King's Cross Railway Station and then Buckingham Palace to meet His Majesty the King and receive it on his behalf. Where he fell on the Somme, the men created a wooden cross, which was later replaced by a beautiful stone memorial called the Bell Redoubt that still sits there to this day. Lieutenant Donald Bell is also remembered here with his own plaque, along with our two other Victoria Cross recipients. At just 16 years old, the son of the jeweller, Walter Ogden, had lied about his age to sign up for the First World War. At 17, he had become the commander of HMS Landship Harrogate. And by the 20th of November 1917, he had taken more ground in three hours than the British and French had taken in three months worth of fighting. However, this was still the very early days of tank warfare. What the British military didn't realise, once you send the tanks in, you need to send the infantry in to hold on to that position. After 10 days of circling around, capturing and recapturing the same ground that they had taken time and time again, the Harrogate tank was struck. The crew managed to move into another tank which was also struck, killing four of the crew. Walter Ogden and a private managed to hobble a mile and a half across no man's land back to a French military hospital where a day later he passed away through infection, something that if it had happened ten years later in the mention of penicillin, he may well have lived. Instead, Walter Ogden is remembered on our war memorial just here. In 1911, the Great British Air Race took place, and its first stop after London was touchdown on the Stray. This is the first time that aeroplanes had flown around the country, and 30 pilots took place, including Britain's favourite James Valentine, a dashing young man flying his Avro Lancaster. The company would later go on to create the Lancaster bomber. Just eight years after the invention of the aeroplane, it had been weaponized. The best way I can describe those early pilots would be a little bit like modern day Formula One drivers, fiercely competitive, but at the end of the day, all best of friends doing an incredibly dangerous sport. At the outbreak of the war, all of the men that flew that day on the stray were recalled to their home nations to fly for their own flying corps. James Valentine was flying reconnaissance missions over Kiev in eastern Ukraine when he was shot down and killed. And although not from Harrogate, this side of our memorial remembers everyone, not just those from our own town. You'll notice that there's only a handful of names on the war memorial where you've got both the first and second name. That's so you know that they were women killed during the conflict. At 16, Betty Stevenson made her way down to King's Cross Railway Station and helped those Belgian refugees find their way to Harrogate, safety and security. When she was just 19, she went across to France and along with working in the French military hospitals, she was assisting these wounded servicemen's families go over and visit them. However, just 21 years old, whilst walking home one night with a few of her colleagues, a German bomber was also returning home and spotted figures walking on the road beneath him. As he had a few spare hand grenades, he dropped his bombs onto Betty Stevenson, 
killing her and her friends instantly. Betty is remembered on our war memorial just here. No one knows where the name for Betty's tea rooms comes from. It is genuinely a mystery and I don't claim to have any insider information. But if nothing else, it's a remarkable coincidence that Betty Stevenson was killed almost exactly a year before the famous tea rooms opened. For those that have joined me in the past, you know, I generally like to keep things quite light-hearted and upbeat, but I've been writing this for the better part of three years now, and I still don't know how to finish it. We live in a remarkable town, not just because of the beautiful architecture and the incredible gardens and wonderful history, but because of the people that make it. People like Hannah and her team over at St. Peter's Church. Hannah turns up there every morning and every afternoon, 365 days a year, organizing a free breakfast club and afternoon supermarket with some of the most vulnerable people in our community. We have the team down at Artisan Cafe that help people that are differently abled get back into the community and be part of the workforce. We have the Friends of the Valley Gardens that help our council plant 600,000 flowers throughout the town every year. We have the Harrogate Civic Society that preserve and enrich the history that we have as a town. They go through our planning applications making sure that things are in keeping. Yes, the 70s have happened in the odd bit, but I think you'll agree we've done remarkably well. We have the Stray Defence Association that have ensured over the last hundred years that this amazing and unique feature to Harrogate hasn't been turned into a car park. But it's not just the people that are here doing these things now. It's the ones that quite literally gave everything that they had, not just to preserve the town, but to enhance upon it. And with that, I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us and enjoy being in Harrogate.